Good evening, British and American Culture class. This is part three of the first lecture on America. Um, I entitled this chapter The Hard Fork, and I explained to you why last in the last part. Uh, now, I've been having technical difficulties with various things, so I won't get into it, but needless to say, somehow, we've managed to get through four lectures. I've managed to get through four, two for you, in one day. So this is a new record, so we'll see how it goes. Um, one of the technical difficulties was in part two, something happened at the end of the video, which I will not get into, so it abruptly cuts off. So I'm just going to start sort of where that ended off, which was I was going to talk about three of the founding fathers, okay? And then we'll get through this stuff, which some of it's been talked about already, but this is just for reference in the background. So I want to talk about George Washington first, because um, George Washington is normally everybody's um, the most respected individual in American culture, you know, the the Yi Sun Shin sort of thing of American culture. And uh, there's a good reason for that. It's because uh, no George Washington, then um, no no victory uh, in the American Revolutionary War. So let's just talk about George Washington briefly. Um, one of the things that Americans say is that George Washington never told a lie. Um, that's of course a myth. So you can expect a multiple choice question on that. Did he never tell a lie? Uh, no, he told lies and he also swore, but he had a reputation for being very well-mannered and I mean, he was um, uptight, more than just well-mannered. He only swore when he, he got incredibly angry, which that did happen. So he would curse officers out on occasion when they did things that were incredibly stupid and they, they, they did things against his orders, um, which he decided deserved um, serious chewing out. Um, and the people that worked with him often mention uh, in their diaries and their, in their comments about him that he, um, he was a very proud man and he, was, he stood on ceremony a lot. So if you like a stiff neck, um, uptight, proud boss, then you're different than me because that's not the type of person you want to work for. Being super easygoing is not a good trait though to be um, a president or uh, the general of, um, of, a, of a military who's overmatched, um, ser seriously overmatched by their, the, the British forces. You know, it was two or three to one in many cases. So it, it was um, George Washington's incredible charisma his leadership skill and his toughness and his decision making, his confidence in himself that enabled him to overcome all these obstacles. And um, although he wasn't a brilliant strategist uh, like a Napoleon or uh, Hannibal or any number of other great generals, Alexander the Great, he's not that type of person. He did have the, the qualities of leadership that were required in the situation where if you have no shoes and you have no food and you're not being paid and you're against regular soldiers that have all of those things, um, are you going to fight or run away or desert or mutiny or cause trouble? Well, you probably would do any of those things except fight. Um, but there was, George Washington had this ability to inspire and motivate uh, the American soldiers, the Continentals that were under his command to fight against uh, a superior, better armed, better equipped, better paid force. And that, in the end, that actually demoralized the British because the British, I mean, most of them expected the, um, the, these ragtag, you know, um, American rebels to, to break and run and give up and, uh, to, to get worn down very quickly, and they didn't. And so, in, as a result, what happened was, I'm not gonna describe to you all the battles and everything, because this is not an American Revolutionary War class. Um, I would like it, in some ways I would like to teach that, but that's probably not gonna happen. That's a history class. What I'm telling you is, is about the individual who became an 
an icon of uh, American culture. And George Washington was able to make, you know, increase the value of each one of his soldiers and to uh, prevent them from, from deserting and from, they, he inspired them so much that they would fight for him no matter what. And that's not what happened on the other side. The British really just wanted, after they realized it was not going to be an easy fight and we're not going to take out the American, uh, you know, forces relatively easy, easily, they were not really keen to fight this drawn out battle. And so they lost. Um, they, uh, in, initially they were winning, but the, uh, the tide turned quite quickly when um, the the Americans persisted and the British gave up. So that's why George Washington is so revered um, as one of the greatest Americans of all time. Uh, Benjamin Franklin is also one of those people. Uh, this whole generation, you, we have to be honest with ourselves, is, you know, I'm not going to comment on <laughs> the quality of politicians these days in America. Uh, there are good ones and there are bad ones, but it seems like there was a... There was a remarkable group of people, and you can say the same thing about the French Revolution, to be honest. Uh, there's just, and they killed each other in the end, and the Americans, thank goodness they didn't, but uh, it's just this, this generation of talented people that get a chance uh, to, to influence what happens in their country, uh, and, and it's just, it's a remarkable group of people. I can't even talk about all of them. Uh, because I don't have enough time, but the list is is long of all of these, you know, uh, military leaders, politicians, businessmen, uh, lawyers, etc. Et that contribute to the formation of the United States. Um, so I'm only talking about three, but in, we'll just say um, George Washington is the military figurehead or the military representative of the military talent, because there's others too, but he is, he is the foremost. Uh, and Benjamin Franklin is, I mean, he's, he's older than the rest of them by quite a bit. So he's not even the same generation, uh, but he's, he comes in as like the elder statesman of the, of the group and the, the most respected and in a lot of ways, the most talented uh, individual in the whole group. And Benjamin Franklin was a uh, multilingual. Uh, he was a successful businessman. He flew a kite and, and uh, observed how electricity worked and invented the lightning rod. Uh, he was chosen to represent the colonies multiple times. Um, Philadelphia is where he called home. And uh, he was sent to the United Kingdom, to England to negotiate where he was insulted and disrespected um, when he was yelled at for about an hour um, by the um, representatives of the British government. So he was initially in favor because he is British, just like all of them are. Uh, but he was convinced when he came back that independence was the only answer. And these uh, crazy guys who yelled at him and, and were irrational were not going to be, you know, be reasonable and compromise. So he decided that he would uh, support independence. So he was chosen to go to France and convince the French that he should be, or that they should participate. Even though because of the Seven, war, seven Years War, as I told you, they were basically broke. How is France supposed to fight another war with the British when they have no money? Um, somehow Benjamin Franklin convinced them that it was a good idea. I have no money, I'll borrow more, more money to help you. Of course they wanted to get revenge because they had lost the Seven Years' War and they had lost Quebec and they were hoping you know, to um, damage the British Empire and to recover some of their lost um, power, in the, especially in the ocean. So um, they, they, they did accept, but it would have, if it wasn't for Benjamin Franklin, I think a lesser diplomat would not have convinced them because ultimately the result of this commitment by the French was the French Revolution and the uh, destruction of the monarchy. And in, in, the, in the British Empire, the result was the loss of the American colonies. So, you know, like I said to you already, the Seven Years' War was like a fight to the death. 
and the American Revolutionary War, in some sense, continued that thing. It's like, oh, you're not dead yet? Well, I'll make sure you're dead this time. And they did knock each other out, just about. So that's how the, the British and French did things. And America gets caught in the middle. Um, not that they want to be, but that there's no choice, really. They, are, um, they, they have to play one side against the other. If you're, I mean, if you're Korean, you can understand this. You, you always got to play the bigger powers on either side of Korea against each other. Otherwise, you're in big trouble. Right? Okay. Uh, Thomas Jefferson is not in the book, unfortunately. He should be. Um, there is a little picture of the, you know, the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, of which he was a very inter integral part. He was the one who actually wrote the Declaration of Independence, and then um, it was because Benjamin Franklin turned it down, even though he was a really famous writer, one of his other talents. He decided he didn't want to do it, probably because he didn't want to be criticized, because what happened when Thomas Jefferson wrote this document, which was a great document, uh, they ripped it apart. Uh, he, he had to submit it to Congress, and, you know, his peers, he, actually he's quite young, he was in his 30s, the people that were older and more experienced than him looked at the document and they, about a quarter of it got changed. And he was quiet through the whole process, but um, probably inside he was just thinking, oh, they're destroying my, my baby. Uh, they're killing my baby. And, and um, that's how I would feel too if somebody took my book and, and ripped it apart and changed 25% of it. I mean, there's such thing as proofreading, and then there's just changing everything. 25% is a lot. But anyway, they, somehow they came up with, I mean, everybody disagreed about everything, but you can imagine, you know, how can you get these days, can you imagine, you know, American Congress, like hundreds of, of representatives agreeing on anything? It's not possible, but these people managed to agree on a document that would create a country. Uh, it's pretty amazing that they were able to do this and that they pretty much had a unanimous support for it. So that is the founding fathers um, that I want you to know. Those three guys, don't forget the most important things about each one. Um, George Washington's personality and uh, how, you know, how his role as a military leader. Benjamin Franklin and uh, how skilled and talented he was and how he helped get the French into the war and how he's insulted by the British. And Thomas, um, Thomas Jefferson, of course. There's lots of other things about him. But the main thing is that he wrote the Declaration of Independence. So they're very important to the, to the future of um, American culture. Now, um, Thomas Jefferson and George Washington in particular owned a lot of slaves. So now we must talk about, we've got to rewind a little bit and talk about, um, you know, the whole racial issue and how colonization and imperialism operate. Um, we're going to talk about industrialization and imperialism this weekend because we have a makeup class. And I didn't give much warning for this, which is, I mean, it's in your syllabus and it's on, you should be aware of it, but I realize some people are not paying attention. And is this Thursday or Friday or Saturday? Or I don't even know if it's Tuesday. I can't figure out what day it is because all the days are blending together. I'm sure you're feeling the same way. Like weekends and weekdays are not that different anymore when you're stuck inside making videos. Um, so I'm just going to open up the cyber lecture from Friday night and just let it run from Friday to Friday, okay? So you, for your makeup class, instead of just Friday, Saturday, which is the usual thing I do, since I didn't give you a heads up this week, because like I said, I lost track of the weeks and the days, uh, I'll just leave it open for a week. So it'll open up on Friday. And on Saturday, I will upload the makeup lecture, which will just be a one shot. We're not going to do the three part thing for the makeup because this is uh, kind of killing me to do this. Um, so I'll just do a one single, probably it's going to be a longer one, 45 minutes to an hour. And that makeup lecture will cover industrialization and imperialism. OK, so we won't get into that too much imperialism, but we do need to finish up basically the 18th century here. 
Um, so Columbus is not at all the 18th century. You can see this guy made his way across the ocean in 1492. Um, now, it's just rewinding to the beginning of the chapter. This is how I start the chapter. Is there, ha there were people that went across. And people are always like, well, Columbus didn't discover America. Of course he didn't. Uh, there was probably like a hundred million people. Nobody knows exactly, but there was like a hundred million people. Get your head around that, okay? If it was in today's population, it was a hundred million. We're talking about, you know, 30% or 40% of the world's population, right? So you're talking about if we went over there now, if we just discovered the Americas now, there would be two billion people living over there. Two billion that's how many natives there were. When I grew up, there was some kind of, I don't know, where, I mean, I guess the idea just came from guilt um, or, you know, Koreans understand this too and you probably, the rest of you can too. It's, there's a tendency in history books just to minimize, not to lie, but just to minimize things that were really, really important uh, at the time, but, if you, if you recognize how serious they were now, they have consequences for your culture now. And you have to deal with them in a way that most people don't want to. And this is the problem with Japan not really recognizing how bad World War II was. At, not just World War II, but before. How they invaded China and they took over Korea. And they, the, the colonial period of, of Korea from 1910 to 1945 was, was horrible. And... That is why Korean people are still upset about it, because there's just not a recognition of how horrible it was. And if there, if there was, then people wouldn't be going to war shrines and saying, oh, it's not a big deal, it's a long time ago. The same thing is true. And I, and I understand how Japan is behaving like that, but you have to, as a, as a if you get, if you educate yourself, you have to realize that um, recognition is the most important thing. Reparation is important too, which is paying money back or we're trying to fix it. But some things can't be, some things can't be uh, fixed. Some some things can't be undone. But uh, the most important thing is to to recognize that it was done, and then then you that's a starting point for all the other things that you can do. Okay, so this is what I how I treat this situation too is that. Fundamentally, the Europeans, um, there was various degrees. The French were better uh, uh, getting along and, and being and accommodating and trading and uh, um, cooperating with the natives. And, and uh, Spanish and, the, and the, the British were worse. And, uh, you, know, the, you know, the Spanish went there first. So all of the stuff that was done by the Spanish, um, the later Europeans claimed that they were doing it. They were, at least they were better than the Spanish or something like that. But, you know, there were good Spanish and bad Spanish and the Spanish were the first ones there. So, you know, to a certain extent, they can say, well, we didn't know what we were doing and we, you know, spread all these diseases around, but we didn't mean to kill that many people and so on. So this is an endless topic that we can get into, but we, we've got to approach it in a manageable way. So let's just say Christopher Columbus has some good aspects about him. Um, he was determined. He was from Genoa in Italy and he went from king to king, even went to King Henry VII in England, which would have been nice because it would have made everything nice and neat and I could have talked about Columbus when I talked about Henry VII, but anyway, he went around and everybody was like, you're crazy, that's a stupid idea. Or I don't have money and I'm too busy. Like Henry the Seventh was not interested in spending a lot of money, sending somebody into an ocean and not wondering wondering if they ever come back. Um, he was very tight-fisted with his money, so that did not appeal to him at all. So he went around. And he just couldn't find anybody to support his voyage, and he needed, you know, basically the the kind of support that a, a king or queen queen could give. So he he eventually made his way to Spain. And Ferdinand and Isabella had just finished the, you know, that year. They had finished um, conquering Spain and, and reunifying Spain and Christianizing Spain and expelling the Muslims. So, you know, the 800 
year project of the Reconquista was complete. And I'm sure you you may know about that or may not, but basically all of Spain was controlled by a, a sort of Muslim um, emirate empire for a long time and gradually they lost hold on it and the, the Christian kingdoms pushed them out. And I don't, I'm not judging whether which religion is better or worse, that's just what happened. But once the Spanish had control of that, then they were looking to expand as a rising kingdom would like to do. So the Spanish, you know, they were fighting with the Muslims in the Mediterranean and, and um, you know, the Turkish were getting more, more and more powerful. So they had to deal with them uh, and they couldn't really deal with the Turks. They weren't strong enough to do that. So they decided, just like the Portuguese, to try and go west and south. Um, so Columbus came at the perfect time and Ferdinand and Isabella said, here's Isabella said, uh, here's a couple of like really crappy ships. You take these ones, the Nina, the Pinta, the Santa Maria. Uh, I know those names because I can remember it from a Rage Against the Machine song. Um, I won't get into that, but that's a great band. You can see it in my playlist. Rage Against the Machine said, the Nina, the Pinta, the Santa Maria, which are the names of the three boats that he took. And he made his way to North America. I don't think, it, it seems that he never actually set foot on America itself, but he went all around the islands and uh, he, he hit land in various spots and then he settled uh, on an island, a larger island, and he um, took advantage of the natives in every way possible. He was essentially hoping, thinking, apparently he believed actually that he was on the edge of maybe the Philippines or, you know... Um, somewhere near Japan or something. So he actually believed he was in the Indies. That's part of the reason why forever we call them the West Indies. We usually call it the Caribbean now, after the Caribs. But um, the Caribbean, you know, Jamaica and uh, Dominican Republic, Haiti and all those, Cuba, all those islands there is where he landed. And uh, there were lots of, there was as many as a million natives living on those islands already. Um, he didn't find anything useful really except for plants and you know food uh, and some native people which he tried to use as slaves but they made horrible slaves they got sick and died and he tried to find gold he tried to send you know gifts back to Spain uh, but basically he started to get frustrated and he started to kill natives work them to death threaten them be violent um, he, he just, he turned it into some sort of um, disturbing um, human, you know, consumption sort of environment where they were just burning through lives in order to find some sort of valuable thing to bring back to the mother country. And uh, he never succeeded in that. He was replaced. And then he w went back to um, Europe and he died. Now, he's, turned, he's been turned into a hero somewhat, uh, which is to the chagrin of a lot of Native people. And I would never celebrate uh, his accomplish, accomplishments. Uh, I'd rather celebrate the Vikings discovering North America because they were there first and they didn't destroy the whole thing and kill millions of people ultimately. But he, he really set a trend um, with European navigation and European you know, um, the intrepid spirit, the, ex the, the desire for exploration and wealth and, and the waves of people that came afterwards, especially initially from Spain and, and Portugal, um, were largely, you know, following in his footsteps. They exploited um, everybody to the hilt. And, and uh, Cortez and um, Pizarro and all those other famous Spaniards afterwards they did find gold and they did find silver and they became fabulously rich. So, well, I guess in a sense, he, Columbus got what he deserved. He died sort of a broken man, um, his dreams shattered, and that's what he deserved. But unfortunately, a lot of the people afterwards did benefit from his, um, his efforts. Um, so that's my spin on it. And we're going we're gonna to talk about natives again later because really the... Um, the American story of natives just hasn't really picked up yet until much later because you can see, you know, by 1607, 
um, Jamestown is being established, and that's already a hundred years later. But just so you're aware, by the time the the English started settling in America, the the diseases had spread. You know, so I mean, it's a hundred years. So these diseases had come into Mexico, and the Spanish had gone to Florida, and the French had come down, and they had been they had exposed people, and those people had spread it. You we're living in the coronavirus. You know, it only takes one. This is the coronavirus. 2020 is a great example of how this works. You just get one person on a boat or one person hanging out with a, a European and then they, they are carrying smallpox and then one native person brings back to the village and that whole village gets infected. And that village, one person goes in a, you know, in a canoe or, or, or a group of people in a canoe go down the river to the next one and it just, it, it kind of spreads ahead of the Europeans. So by the time the Europeans get to some places, the natives are just recovering from devastation like you wouldn't believe. We're gonna see millions of people die from the coronavirus, which is gonna be something like, it's gonna be less than 1% of the world's population for sure, but like the, the mortality rate is 3%. But in the native population, we're talking about 80 to 90% of people dying, right? We're talking about like, eight and nine out of 10 people dying. Not one out of a thousand people dying like we have now. It's not even one out of a thousand, it's less than that. You know, and we control it and everything, but this is, this is like uh, the everybody's worst nightmare. It wipes out everybody to the extent that basically villages just collapse. Like, you know, um, the Europeans come to places and there's a village there and there's just, it's just empty. And it's been empty for years and there's just, Basically, not even graves or anything. There's just bodies lying around uh, because it's so horrible. So this is the reality that that is the result of the the contact between the Europeans and the North Americans. It's a very sad story, and I I wish I had more time to explain in detail about that. But while this, you know, uh, I mean, Europe, most Europeans are completely unaware of what they're doing. They didn't know. It's just like somebody with coronavirus who has no symptoms. They didn't know to stay home or anything. They just spread it around and then the consequences though they took advantage of, which I guess we can't blame them for completely. But the Seven Years War marks the middle of the century and then the Revolutionary War finishes the, the century off with the Americans gaining their independence in 1783. Remember, America celebrates 1776 as its birthday. But 1783 was actually the end of the war, where they signed the Treaty of Paris and the British formally recognized the existence of the American, uh, the new American country, which was composed of the 13 colonies. Um, what else can I say without uh, um, going off topic too much? Um, I, I'm not going to talk about anything too much that happens after this, but uh, George Washington becomes the president and he does two terms and that sets the trend which continues now there's a two-term limit but basically for a long time every president um, who was elected never ran for a third term because George Washington didn't uh, until Franklin Delano Roosevelt broke that that um, pattern in uh, World War II um, but essentially at the end at the end of this century we have <clears throat> In the Seven Years' War, we have native people fighting with the French against the English and some other native people fighting with the, the English against the French, the British against the French. Um, those people are called the Iroquois, and we'll talk about them later. But um, most of the natives, of, natives prefer the French. And when the French lose, uh, they're like, oh, no, this is not good for us. Now we have to deal with the British. And then when the British fight the Americans, they're terrified of the Americans because the Americans are essentially, one of the reasons they're fighting for independence is because the British crown is trying to restrict them from expanding uh, too far and, and for, to, to prevent them from having these conflicts with the native people by taking their land. But the American people want that land and they want to, once they get to the Appalachian Mountains, they want to go over the mountains and they want to go in the Mississippi Valley and they want to go and, and take the free land that it's not free, it belongs to somebody else, but they don't care. Uh, and the British try to re, re, you know, restrict them and prevent them from doing that, but 
uh, along with the taxes uh, and with the control and the presence of the, the government and the lack of freedom they feel like they have, they want to be able to um, take that land and use it uh, because they consider it to be available despite the fact it's already occupied by, by natives. So when the British fight against the Americans, the natives try to help them again and the British lose, which is a, it's a complete disaster. Because one, they're on the wrong team, so the Americans say, well, you fought against us, so now we're not, not going to respect your rights. And, and in addition, the Americans really weren't likely to respect their rights anyway. So this, this contributes to, along with the disease and uh, with, with the attitude of the Europeans, especially the new Americans, uh, the, the colonists, the British colonists, and then the Americans, this contributes to um, a very, very... Um, detrimental environment for the future of the native people in North America. We will talk, talk about them again uh, in the 19th century. We'll come back to them when we talk about um, when we talk about the Wild West and uh, the American frontier. One last thing. Remember that in 1776 everybody's British. In 1783 everybody's American including Thomas Jefferson and George Washington and Benjamin Franklin and John Adams and Samuel Adams and James Madison and everybody else. Uh, all the John Hancock and all the rest of those guys, they're all British and they decide to make them into, they decide to make them their own country, they're rebels, and then they become American. Um, there are a lot of people who don't want to be American and they actually tried to help the British and uh, they, they gave their opinion and they, they protested and even, you know, provided money and equipment to the British to try and keep the colonies in the British Empire. When the Americans win, when the rebels win and the British Empire um, gives up, you end up with thousands and thousands of people that are blamed and are guilty, essentially, of of collaborating with the British Empire. So those people have a pretty hard time and they don't want to really be there anyway because they they didn't want to be a part of a republic. They wanted to remain British. So uh, there is a mass exodus. It happens over the about 10 year period from 1780 to 1790 over that decade. They, a lot of them leave, uh, a lot of them go back to England um, but there's about 100,000 or so that go to Canada, which is now English, the English part of Canada, not the French part. But um, this essentially results in the creation of Canada. Because in Canada, there was a small amount of British English speakers and a large amount of French. But this influx of about 100,000 loyalists uh, and my... Um, my university has a statue, not very far from it, in downtown Hamilton, uh, of the loyalists that left America and they took all of their belongings and their family and they, they transplanted themselves into what was known as Upper Canada at the time. And uh, essentially this leveled out, uh, made a more of a, a balanced proportion between the French and English, which, which basically laid the groundwork for what would become Canada because um, slowly but surely the English would become the majority in population. Obviously they had the power and the authority and the military, you know, and the political power was in their hands, but the population was largely French. But after this, uh, there was, you know, a proportion of, uh, of Canadians that were former British subjects that did not belong, didn't feel like they were comfortable or, or were flat out, you know, turned away from their places in America. And so they made their way to Canada. And um, that is really a fundamental event in the creation of Canada. You could also, you could almost say that, as I say in my book, that it didn't just, this revolutionary, American Revolutionary War didn't create one nation, it created two. Um, because it, it um, caused the immigration to Canada that would um, lay the foundation for the population that would grow into the present-day country of Canada. So um, that is all I have for this week, and that brings us up 
to around 1800, we're going to have to rewind a little bit again because the, the Industrial Revolution starts in Great Britain in the middle of the 18th century. But we will start at that point and then we will go forward to the 19th century um, when we talk about imperialism and industrialization this weekend for the makeup class. So I thank you for listening to this lecture. Um, I'm, it's always a pleasure for me to talk to you. I wish I saw you in person, but uh, this is what it's going to be like for the rest of the term. So please keep tuning in and uh, keep the questions coming. I enjoy, you know, the short little conversations I have, and uh, I, I certainly want to address any questions that you direct my way uh, into the lectures. I'll incorporate them to my lectures as I've been doing. So that's it. Have a good night and see you this weekend for the makeup lecture.